Are you ready for some Jersey? Well, we've got Jersey. The zipper was made here. The light bulb was made here. The color television calls the Garden State home. Everybody wants to know about New Jersey. Sandy beaches, beautiful cities. We even have the Jersey Turnpike. Inventors, music, the movies. You need an exit? We got them too. You want Jersey? This is Jersey. Welcome to this edition of This is Jersey. We're in Jersey City today talking to Italian comedian and hometown guy Mike Marino. Mike has had a varied career in show business, starting out in commercials and now headlining at the historic Jersey Lowe's Theater in his home city. His comedy centers around his Italian heritage and in his riotous act you'll find the usual suspects. The Mafia, the Accents, and the Big Sunday Dinners. He's also got an ongoing election-themed YouTube series, as well as a television pilot in the works. We caught up with him at the Lowe's Theater to get his thoughts on the big show and to hear about his hysterical career. Tell me about growing up here in the city and then leaving. You know, I was born in Jersey City, and my family's all from Jersey City, and I think anybody with the last name Marino is from Jersey City, and, and, uh, and Greco, and, and, and my mother's last name was Berardo. Um, you know what, when you're growing up in a city like this, you say you move out to the suburbs, and in the suburbs, in a one mile square radius is your neighborhood. But in Jersey City, your neighborhood is in the building that you're in. So when you want to talk to other people that are in your family, or other people that are in your neighborhood, you open the window and you say, hey Anthony, are you going to the store? I need to go myself. That was the difference in the neighborhoods, right? Then all of a sudden you got things like, nicknames for people that you really don't know well. And when you're six, seven years old, and there's a nickname for a neighbor, you think that's their actual real name. We grew up next to a lady, her name was Angie. We thought her last name was Pangy, because they would say, hey, watch out for the neighbor, Angie Pangy. So when a little kid, you're like, hello, Angie Pangy, she started screaming at you, why'd you call me Pangy? Well, we thought it was your name, you know? That was, that was Jersey City. So you left here when you were about five? No, no, no. I was in the city until I was, let's say, eight years old. Okay. But my grandmother owned the building that we grew up in or that she grew up in. Her great-grandfather owned it. And so it's been going back for, let's say, 100 years. Uh -huh. And then you, you, you go into kindergarten. So my experience, my first experience in going to school is uh, kindergarten in Jersey City and then Mount Carmel Church. You know, I remember when I was going to school and you go out on the playground if you did something wrong, your punishment was stand against the fence. You stood against the fence and you were petrified that some nun might crack you in the head. Then you were even more petrified that when you got home, your parents would find out they'd crack you in the head even harder because the nun had to crack you in the head first. Try that today. Eh? You get cracked in the head by anybody. Everybody's going to jail but the kid, including the parents. So you leave beautiful Jersey City to go to Scotch Plains. How did that happen? Well, I think we were leaving Jersey City, uh, uh, my immediate family, mother and father, my two brothers, to go to, uh, let's say, Scotch Plains, New Jersey, which is where we went. And that's a suburb, suburban town, uh, let's say, to get away from what might have been uh, a, bad, a worse neighborhood. Maybe the neighborhood was getting bad. So we went. I remember everybody crying when we were leaving, too, because we were crying, too. I'm like, wait a minute, how can we be leaving here? We know everybody here. How often are we going to come back? But Grandma still owned the building, so we were coming back every other Sunday. Uh, you don't miss going to Grandma's house on a Sunday afternoon. Grandma was going to Mount Carmel Church. At 2 o'clock, we were having spaghetti and meatballs, like every other Italian person in the building. You know? And then we didn't stop that tradition. So even to this day, I'm still eating macaroni on a 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday with as many people as I could find, whether they're from the old neighborhood of Jersey City or actually the old neighborhood of Scotch Plains. It really doesn't matter. 2 o'clock, don't be late because, like, I say in my act, this could be the last supper. Now, did you get in trouble as a kid in school? Oh yeah, I was always getting in trouble. Not because I did anything wrong. I just had this flair for comedy. I always wanted to make people laugh. I wanted to do something funny and silly. So I, let's say I was a prankster. I would pull pranks on people, you know? I used to have these fireworks that I would attach them to a door, and if somebody came through the door, it would explode, and it would scare the crap out of you. I mean, nobody got hurt, but you know, I liked doing it. I never really went to prison because I knew a lot of people. Now, you said you were in construction. Did you go to college? I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York City. That was basically my college, my college because I wanted to be an actor most of my life. From when I was a little child, I was always imitating people. I was always uh, 
uh, impersonating TV commercials. I was impersonating my family. I always used to impersonate my Uncle Tommy. My Uncle Tommy was from Jersey City, right? And he would do things like this. Oh, you want to be an actor, huh? Well, they don't got actors anymore. They only had good actors back in my day. Like my favorite movie, the actors were in a movie called Gone with the Storm. I said, you mean Gone with the Wind? Whatever it was, the wind, the storm, it doesn't matter. I'm like, well, I thought you said you saw it. No, I never saw it. I only heard about it. Now, how do you not imitate that guy? I'll never forget when he said to me one day, he goes, hey, did you see what your president did? He finally listened to your Uncle Tommy. I said, Uncle Tommy, you don't know the president. You mean Ronald Reagan? And he goes, yeah, I know Reagan. And I go, what are you talking about? You don't know the president. He goes, I knew him when he was nothing but a singer. I go, he's not a singer, he's an actor. And he goes, they're all actors. But he meant that. Now, how am I not going to do that on stage? Now, you're performing here at the Lowe's Theater. What's it yes. like for you to do that? I can't wait to come to the Jersey City Lowe's Theater because it's a classic. It's a landmark. This theater's been around since 1929. Seats 3,000 people. There's a history here. And my father used to work the door here when he was a kid. He was probably between 14 and 16 years old. And a lot of people back in the day probably had part-time jobs or, 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 or a job working the door at the theater because this was the place to be. I mean, could you imagine walking into a place that's this gorgeous that the, the curator was just telling us that walking into the lobby alone made you say, you know what, we really don't even need to see the project. The lobby's out of control, like being on the Titanic and set and sail. So it's a great uh, honor to be performing here. I can't wait to stand on this stage. This place is going to be jumping with Mike Marino fans from Jersey City and around the country. In fact, I got people from Virginia flying in to see the show, North Carolina. We got some Texans flying in, and we'll make fun of them while they're here. So you weren't a, a comic starting out. You were still involved with your family's construction business, and you got into acting. Tell me what that was like in the earlier years. Growing up in show business is very difficult. You never know what's going to happen. You might make a living. You might not make a living. One day you're making a lot of money. The next day you're not making any money, right? So I always stayed in touch with the family, and I worked in my family's construction business. I mean, I actually know how to use a jackhammer. I could put up a building. I could run a roller. I could run a backhoe. I can actually pave a street, you know? I don't really want to anymore, but I can. Well, eventually, that's what spinned me off into a sitcom. Reconstructing Jersey is about my family being in the paving business, just like it really was when I was a teenager in my early 20s, and both my brothers are still in that business. So, you know, we're gonna make it really happen. It's very funny, and, and there we go. Mike, that's great. We have to take a break now. We come back, we're gonna go inside the Lowe's, check it out, and talk more about your career. We'll do that when we come back. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to This Is Jersey. We're now inside the Jersey Lowe's Theater in Jersey City with comedian Mike Marino, who's performing for the first time in this amazing venue in his hometown. He's going to tell us a little more about how he got started in show business. Well, you know, I don't even know if the first comedic job was a job, because the first time I did stand-up comedy, I was actually, uh, it was either Jersey City or Bayonne, and it was at a friend's restaurant. They were having a comedy competition. It was all these guys trying out their material. And I had been on several TV commercials at that time. So I'm thinking, you know what? I could do stand-up. I could do stand-up. So uh, I think it was like, let's say it was a challenge. Like uh, somebody in my family said, uh, well, why don't you go up and get on stage and you tell some jokes. So I figured, okay, I'll give it a shot. So I went up there and I just started making fun of my mom and what my mother says, you know? Things like, I'm not cooking for the family anymore. I've had it. This is it. You, know, you could all get out and go over your friend's house. And so I went on stage and I did it and I won. And uh, I think they paid 50 bucks to the winner. And when I was done, I, there was a talent coordinator there. And he goes, how long have you been a stand-up comedian? And I says, I've never done this in my life. And he goes, you probably should keep going. And I, that was it. That was it. That was, and I, I was like 29 years old. Did you use the Last Supper uh, story in that? <laughs> I don't know if I did the Last Supper story then, but let's say that was the inception of it, because this was where it was going to develop, because the truth is always funny, and my mother does speak like that, and she did talk like that. So it eventually developed into this is the Last Supper routine, which quite honestly is my favorite routine, and it, it gets pretty much the biggest laugh. Why don't you share that? Uh, okay, well... In, in all actuality, my mother would cook for 50 people 
all the time. I mean, she really did. She cooked for 50 people every single day. They weren't there, but just in case they came, the food was waiting. And as soon as everybody would come over, they would be done eating the food. My mother said the same thing. She goes, you know, they all better get a good look at this food that I just made because this is it. This is the last time I'm cooking. So I used to say all the time, it's, it's, she said it so much. And all the time that I'm thinking, you know, maybe my mother's greatest ancestor was responsible for the last supper. And she walked around saying, you know, Jesus, I need to talk to you about something. I've had enough of your friends. These guys you call the apostles, they don't appreciate when I cook. Nobody comes over with bread and wine or, or leave some bread and wine. You know what? Call your friend Leonardo da Vinci. Tell him I said, paint a big picture of all your friends eating because this is it. This is the last supper. Is and for 40 a... days and 40 nights, they fasted because she wouldn't cook. And Talisa came and then she cooked. And that's why Christ rose again from the dead. He smelt the sauce and the meatballs. Jesus was Italian. Is there something funny about growing up in an Italian household? I think everything's funny about growing up Italian. How could it not be? I mean, because our family was basically uh, so, let's say, Jersey-esque, Italian-esque, that most of the time we were eating in the basement because the, the kitchen upstairs was for, I don't know, better people or something. So we ate downstairs in the basement, and, you know, your mother made the sauce from scratch and the meatballs, and, and how could you not find the comedy? Aunts and uncles would come over to the house. My uncle Tommy used to come over to the house and say, it's two o'clock. How come we didn't eat yet? I'm disgusted. Yet he didn't do anything. He didn't help. Plus his stories were classics too. And that would spin off into stand-up material too. So once you got that first break, what happened next? You know, I don't even know if it's a, if it's a first break. I think we go through breaks every week, every month. Like, uh, something great happens on a Monday, something bad happens on a Friday, then the following week something tremendous happens, and then the following month you can't get arrested. So I don't even know what a, a break is, although you get mini breaks. And even if you had like this major break, like you broke through and you became a multimillionaire, you're probably going to be looking for another break. But my first break would be when I started doing TV commercials. I started at a very young age, so at 16 years old, and we're walking around New York City hoping to get on television. Uh, the stand-up comedy break, if it was the day that I did that stand-up gig, it was called the Sunrise Pine Room. Yeah, the Sunrise Pine Room. I was 20, 28 years old, 29 years old, and that was in Bayonne. And what year are we talking about? I don't even remember the year because, you know, I'm still, th I'm only 31. <laughs> what about your TV appearances? I know you were on The Tonight Show at one point. Well, you know what happened? I auditioned to go on The Tonight Show. This is probably going back 15 years, let's say. And I thought I was auditioning to do stand-up comedy on The Tonight Show. And I wasn't. I was auditioning to do sketch comedy. And they did a lot of sketches on the show. So when I went down there and I got the job, the casting director said to me, do a couple of skits on the show, let Jay see what you like, and eventually you do some stand-up on the show. So I'm like, fantastic, I'm going to be on a Tonight Show. And then you're going down there at 10 o'clock in the afternoon or in the morning, and you're rehearsing these funny skits with Jay Leno himself. So I started going, wow, can you believe this? I'm actually doing lines with Jay Leno. And then I did one, two, three. Before you know it, I'm on the show a hundred times. It was a gag sometimes. Sometimes you were prompted in the audience to ask him a question, to set him into a joke. And they would, it, it was just going on and on and on. And I remember Jay saying to me one day, he, uh, no, the casting director said, well, we're doing a skit on Thursday. Jay wants to know if you can make it. And I go, wait a minute. Jay Leno wants to know if I can make it? And he said, yeah, he loves when you come on the show because he knows if you do a live skit and it doesn't go right, you'll pick up the pieces. And I'm like, okay, great. So I never did stand up on the show. I was always a sketch player. Then one year I did uh, stand up on the Martin Short show when he had a show. And I remember I taped stand up comedy on the Martin Short show. Two days later it aired and I went and did a skit on the Tonight Show. And I remember the talent coordinator going, didn't I just see you doing stand up on the Martin Short show? And I said, yeah. And she's like, you do stand-up? I'm like, do you all talk to each other? And, and, and she's like, I don't think Jay knows you do comedy. I thought we were an actor. And I'm like, well, I'm glad I'm the jack of all trades, as long as I'm on all the shows. 
So then later, eventually, I guess, when I went on a couple of other talk shows, and then I went on the Comics Unleashed show, which was a, a breakout, let's say. Um, we are now at 9.5 million views because of the joke I did on Comics Unleashed, the Byron Allen show. We know you don't only do TV, but you've done a lot of live performances. What were the early ones like and the venues you worked? Well, of course, you know, live performing is a lot different than a TV appearance. A TV appearance is very structured. You only have a certain amount of time, and, and um, usually the audience is prompted to just cheer and laugh no matter what. A live performance, it's do or die. And uh, I've been all around the world now, I would say almost twice. I'm very lucky, very fortunate, and, and, and performing live is the greatest feeling in the world. So if you're doing a thousand seat theater from Atlantic City all the way to Canada, or you're in uh, Vegas and there's a thousand people and they spent a good amount of money to come and watch you perform, it's just the greatest high. And sometimes you're in theaters that are brand new, state of the art, and sometimes you're in theaters that have been built in the 1920s and you kind of feel like maybe there's the ghost of Charlie Chaplin there, or maybe the ghost of the, the Marx Brothers, and you know, and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm a part of history. But it's also the high of people actually pay to watch you perform live for an hour and 15 minutes, and to go home laughing, and hopefully they go home thinking, I remember my childhood because of Mike Marino, or I re remember the way my family was because of Mike Marino or they just had the greatest time and they forgot about their problems for a day because of Mike Marino. <laughs> That's great Mike. We have to take a break now. We come back we want to talk about some of your other projects including your web series. We'll do that when we come back. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to This is Jersey. We're back to continue our conversation with Italian comedian Mike Marino, a headliner here at the Jersey Lowe's Theater in Jersey City. So Mike, you've done a lot of things in your career, but what are some new projects you're working on? I understand you have a movie that's just come out. Well, yes, I uh, was very lucky. About a year ago, we did a movie called Criticized, which is a thriller, and I'm uh, lucky enough to be the co-star. This is my acting chops, okay. no comedy. Okay. And I play detective looking for the murderer and should be out hopefully by the end of the year, so let's say December, maybe Christmas time, and it's called Criticized. And um, I did this uh, TV project called Reconstructing Jersey. And Reconstructing Jersey I wrote and created because I think we're ready for a modern family version slash New Jersey-esque show. And it's about my life growing up in an Italian household and uh, with my family and friends. And it's, it stems from my stand-up routine. So I think a lot of people would enjoy that show. And recently, I guess, because of being on Comics Unleashed, one, I went on the show and I said, if we had an Italian president from New Jersey running the country, we would have whacked Osama bin Laden. Well, it got so many views that I thought, you know what, what if this was a web series? A web series, just about me and a couple of my knuckle-headed friends on our way to the White House. And if the mob did take over the country. So I think it would be really funny. And uh, that's what we're doing. And you can actually watch it. We've got millions of people watching this series. It's on YouTube. And watch me and my comedic friends and some celebrities. Won't mention their names right now. We've got celebrities in my web series. And i got a great producer and director working with me. They're fantastic. There's, uh, Cody Boyson, uh, who is directing the project, and uh, Tatiana Bluchel, who's the producer of the project. And the three of us come up with these great, funny, Jersey-esque style mobster family. Picture the Sopranos taking over the White House, if you will. Why is it funny being Italian and growing up in New Jersey? Could that work in like Nebraska or West Virginia? It's actually 10 times funnier for an Italian guy like me from New Jersey to play Nebraska, or to play anywhere in the Midwest, or to play Texas. I'm going to Dubai, I'm going to Australia, I'm going all around the world, I'm going to India, because the world has an affection for Italian guys from New Jersey, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yes, it's funny here. I remind everybody about their lives and that we can laugh at it. It's 10 times funnier if you put it someplace else. Because believe it or not, they look at you like, wow, those people really exist. It's not just a joke on television. 
and, and I'm happy doing it. Now, you don't look like the typical Italian. You have some light skin. Tell me about that. Are you all Italian? Yeah, well, my mother's actually from Italy. My father's from Jersey City, New Jersey. And uh, there's nothing else in this breed. I am a full-blooded Italian, and I'm proud of it. So give us some of your Italian Jersey shtick that we haven't talked about yet. Well, you know, my campaign is based on if we had uh, everybody in the world ate some pizza, they'd be a lot happier. Let's be honest, you can't be angry with a slice of pizza in your hand. Maybe when we're done taping, we'll go downstairs and get a couple of dirty water dogs. How could you be upset when you have some food in your hand, right? Plus, I stand on, you know, very firm on the pizza party, pizza party platform. And as Trump is going around telling everybody, let's make America great again, I'm telling everybody, let's make America Italian again. When you reference your family members, you've referenced your mom here and others, uh, do they get a kick out of that? Do they enjoy being a part of your jokes? Oh, yeah. The family always gets a kick out of being part of what's going on, all right? They'll usually say something like, it's Friday night. Where are you going? I'm like, well, I got a show. Oh, what are you going to do when you're done? Like they think this is easy. It's a piece of cake. I'm in construction, my brother will say. I work every day. I'm dying over here. You just tell jokes. It's easy. I'm like, no, it's really not that easy. But that's where you can get comedy from. Plus, we're, we're getting later in life, too. People are in their late 40s, early 50s. We've got new material for these people. I mean, how many times did you stand still and say to yourself, ow, something went wrong in my body, you know? So it is, there's always new stuff coming around. You said you've worked with um, Jay Leno. What other celebrities, uh, comedians, have you worked with in the past? Fortunately and luckily, I've worked with a lot of celebrities now. And um, I, I've been touring as an opening act or part of the Dina Martin Show. Dina Martin is Dean Martin's daughter. I've been happy to be part of that show. Robert Davi. Robert Davi's been in, in more movies than I can even talk about. He made 150 movies, and he stands in front of a 34-piece orchestra, and he called me up because he knows that I'm friends with Joe Montaigne, and I had done a roast for Joe Montaigne. Why does a guy with blonde hair and blue eyes have a name like Mike Marino? The guy looks like he's Swedish. Louis Prima Jr., Louis Prima's son, and uh, we've been touring, and, uh, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a good amount of others. You know, uh, I think about a month ago, I was performing, and Flavor Flav was in the audience, and he kept on going, Flavor Flav, and I'm like, yeah, not now, but it's nice to know he's a fan of my work, and, uh, yeah, a good amount of endorsements from many different celebrities. Mike, I'm really, really proud of you. It's amazing all these years later, they're by Met Italian. What can I say, man? You're, uh, you should run for president. <laughs> Wonderful thing about Mike is he's very warm. You know, you get a good feeling from, uh, from having been in his company. Share some of the commercials you've been in. Uh, when I was about 14, 15 years old, I started going from uh, Jersey City to uh, New York City and lending my hand to hopefully get some commercials. And, uh, you know, from peanuts and candy and potato chips. And uh, I tell this story all the time. I was going around the city and people said to me, you're never gonna work in this business. You sound like you're from New Jersey. People don't like people who sound from New Jersey. And I was like, oh man, I'll go home and cry. I'm like, I'm never gonna make it in the business. Well, I knew about this audition for this commercial for United Airlines, and I knew there were thousands of people going. So I crashed the audition. I wasn't supposed to be there. And, and I went in and I wanted so badly to do it and try it, and well, I got the job. They auditioned 3,000 real U.S. Marines for this and a bunch of actors and, and I got it. And I was 18 years old, I think, at the time, between 16 and 18, let's say. And I went to California for my first time, first time I was ever on an airplane. And we shot this commercial, it was called The Green Marine for United Airlines. And when the commercial came out, they shaved off all my hair and I looked like a Marine. I played the Marine on the airplane. Well, it was the number one campaign of all time. For five years it ran. I made a great amount of money and I remember going back to New York and I met this agent and she said to me where do you think you're gonna go with this crew cut that you have and that voice and her assistant said Shh, this is Mike Marino from the Green Marine commercial oh I'm so sorry and they signed me across the board I had an audition for Full Metal Jacket within five days and then the commercial got nominated for Clio Awards and I got nominated for a Clio Best Male Performer and I remember I went to Radio City Music Hall. They announced my name as a nominee. I didn't win. I lost to Chuck McCann, who was in the Dr. Pepper commercials, if you remember. But I became one of the top five commercial actors in New York City for at least 10 years. 
Great. Well, Mike, thank you so much for being on our show, and hopefully we'll have you back again soon. I'd love to be back. And thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time.